Pro Ini Oke okay, saya akan di sini I can hear you, but it's very light. Oh, right. I'm Omid Khan. I would like to welcome all of you to our international webinar series on endodontics. Today we have Dr. Shreya from Russia, and now I would like to welcome everyone. So I would like to first of all explain about how you will. be getting your certificate of this webinar and how will we'll go for it first of all you all are available on our website and on this is broadcasted to our zoom in which host and our speaker is present and next thing will be you have to ask question in the end of the session in the chat box of our website we will forward your questions to dr swet and he will answer you there there will be a 30 second delay in broadcasting to website so keep patient in getting your answer and after the session within 3 to 4 days there will be a quiz we will announce on our pages and website you have to attend that quiz and you can then get your certificate so i will like to ask dr shape to continue with his session thank you so much all right uh, can anybody make me the host here so i can share my screen oh i think i can now uh, uh... all right can you see my screen here <laughs> and uh, can you hear me clearly also yeah you are clearly audible all right uh, um so hello to everybody who are attending here uh, first of all i really want to thank you all um and i want to thank uh, especially uh, aid for uh, you know giving me the ext extending me the invitation to come here and uh, speak to you all uh, i'm pretty excited this is one topic that i thought um, you know it's not much talked about you know not everybody has a lot of information about this uh so i thought this would be a good topic i've kept it very general very uh you know not very advanced but you know i just thought uh, we should talk about the indications and just move uh, move on from there uh hopefully you guys will learn something from this one here um so my name is uh, shweb siddiqui uh, a little history about myself uh, i did my dentistry which is my bds uh, from pakistan in 2000 and then uh, i went ahead and did my masters uh, in restorative dentistry from england uh, in 2006 uh then after a long period of uh, you know teaching and some clinical experience i went ahead and did my masters uh, my residency in endodontics from usa and uh, at present i'm working uh, as a full time endodontist in a practice uh, in the us itself uh my practice is limited to endodontics i do not do anything else besides root canal treatments uh now and uh, all my procedures are done under the microscope here um just a disclaimer before i start so if you see any brand names or if you see any products or whatever uh, on my presentation um uh, i just want to let you know that i have no interest or no financial benefits or benefits of any sort in fact uh, and they're just displayed here for uh, for teaching purposes only um all the cases that you will see in in this uh, presentation are my personal cases uh, except where uh, i have used something from the internet or from somebody else i'll uh, mention that there it's uh so you know just to begin with the introduction of radiographs uh, you know uh, it has always been a clinician's main diagnostic aid where we have always a patient comes to you they, they you know tell you about their complaints we take an x-ray and that's that was guides uh, guides us towards the diagnosis okay um it just keeps your this keep this uh, diagnostic aid word in your mind okay so it's the clinician's main diagnostic aid and i'll come back to this towards the end of this presentation also uh so the convention we are doing it right now what we all do everybody has in the practices in the universities is uh, a conventional 
uh, kind of a um, you know an extra cone head where you put the extra film inside the mouth and you take an uh, you know um, extra cone head there and you take an extra. So this is very common. Okay, um, and, and X-rays have come a long way. Uh, radiographs, especially in dentistry, have come a long way. Uh, starting from the first first image uh, in dentistry, uh, right here, to coming to films, okay, and then coming to digital X-rays. Um, and so we have advanced, uh, and our images have gotten better, clearer. Uh, you know, the advantage of your digital X-rays now is that um, you know you can play with the contrast. You can uh, you know uh, zoom in and zoom out. You can measure your length uh, digitally over there. Uh, you get more details. Um, just a fun fact about this first dental X-ray here was done by Valkov uh, in, in 1896. And he exposed himself for 25 minutes to get this image. Now imagine uh, we, we take a split of a second maybe, you know, just a beep and you get your X-rays. This guy sat there with the film in his mouth for 25 minutes. I don't know if there was a film or not, whatever he did, but he sat there being exposed for 25 minutes. So that was crazy um, in those days. Uh, but you can see how how we move forward. Um, but the challenges with uh, uh, conventional radiographs that we do, you know, with film holders or with digital X-rays, is uh, is something that I picked up from this textbook of oral radiology uh, by Scott White. Uh, I think they displayed this very beautifully here. So if you look at this front view of this house, for example, you go like, okay, there's a house over here that has a chimney at the top. Uh, the chimney is like a triangular shaped chimney. Uh, but if you go from the side view, you go like, wait a second, that that's not a chimney, that's that's a tower, and there's a little there's a little you know little room or little alley in the middle of the house and that tower there, and then you go like, okay, uh, and then you look from the top view now, and you go like, wait a second, um, that alley is not a straight walk, it's a curved path, and uh, what I thought was a triangle actually has a round base. Uh, so with the conventional radiographs, we are missing these these views. So we don't have a 3D view and we're depending on a 2D view uh, for our diagnosis and planning and, you know, whatever you want to do with your radiographs there. Um, so I thought this depicted the whole thing very beautifully. Uh, there are many pictures on internet these days, uh, you know, with the hand and everything showing uh, the importance of different views, but I thought this was a very nice uh, way to show it also. Um, so then came in cone beam computer tomography, that CBCD that we are going to talk about today. These are the various machines. Uh, that are being used uh, today and uh, they have come with a multi-planner kind of a view where you can see the jaw or the tooth and, and uh, or the point of interest uh, in different uh, um, uh, planes. Um, so uh, and, and the, another good thing about this uh, uh, the CBCT is that you can alter your um, the field of view you know you want to just concentrate on the whole face or you want to concentrate on one tooth uh, not one tooth, but but you know uh, you know that region basically. So you have uh, uh, you can see on the right side you have 15 by 15, you have 12 by 8, you have 8 by 6, 5 by 5. Uh, so these are different uh, uh, diameter and height that you can uh, take your uh, views from. Uh, not all machines have this uh, option, uh, especially with 5 by 5, which is more required for endodontics. Uh, but uh, there are some specific machines who do that, and it's very very useful. Uh, most of the CBCT machines that are being used uh, are basically more used for implants these days. So they, they take a whole jaw basically, and, uh, and that's not very preferable for end, uh, our endo work here. Uh, now, if you look at this, this is just another way of showing you uh, how what kind of a view you get. So if you just look at the one on the left, that's five by five. Some of the machines will also give four by four, so that's a smaller uh, box uh, over there. And that's very optimal. You get three to four teeth, and you see uh, whatever you want to see. and um, of course, within, just within that view, you can move your, uh, look at those three different angles and, and get a better uh, image uh, and picture in mind then. Uh, this is uh, a view that, uh, you know, uh, I got from my, uh, you know, somebody I, I like very much. I followed for a long time. I've met him. I've kept in touch with him. Uh, that's Dr. Uh, Castellucci. Uh, he's a very famous endodontist, an excellent clinician from Italy. Uh, I had the chance to meet him in Saudi Arabia when I was teaching there. Uh, I bought his books uh, and he you know, signed those books for me also. Uh, so this is one of the views that he has used in his current book. So you can see what a CBCT image can uh, offer you. Uh, so you have a sagittal view, you have an axial view, and you have a coronal view uh, that you can uh, maneuver around with and get more a better uh, understanding of what's going on there. The sagittal view basically is something that goes from the 
local to the lingual. So you can move that image in and out from the from from left to right, for example. The axial view will show you uh, from top to bottom. Uh, that's superior to inferior. So you can move that in that plane also and get more details. And the coronal view is more of anterior posterior or from uh, front to back. Okay. And this is another way of showing uh, the same views here. Uh, so why CBCD? Okay, so why are we moving more towards CBCD? So we have, the, I just discorded down this few studies. I want to keep it more clinical. So I don't want to bore you with all these numbers and papers, uh, you know, so let's, let's just keep it more clinical, more exciting, more fun to understand uh, better. Uh, but just very quickly, you know, in 2008, uh, you know, this Warnox et al. This showed that CBCD detected PA lesions more than the uh, conventional radiographs. Uh, also, it helped in detecting additional findings such as expansion of lesions into the maxillary sinus, uh, the sinus membrane thickening, and the missed canals. And they suggested that they, it should be used for preoperative treatment planning. Uh, in 2011, Westlink uh, et al. Uh, they also showed that um, uh, PA radiographs detected apical periodontitis, uh, periodontitis 71% of the time, and CBCT was 84% of the time. I mean, the matchup with the histopathology when they extracted the teeth, uh, uh, you know, it was very close to what uh, it actually showed. So CBCT was more confirmative, more sensitive, uh, and more accurate in showing uh, lesions. Uh, as a Vito, uh, he's my mentor, my teacher. Uh, I learned CBCT under him. Uh, one of the best uh, um, CBCT specialists, endodontist um, in the US here, and he's internationally renowned. Uh, he also showed that, you know, CBCTs are very accurate with detecting, but anything that's less than 0.8 millimeters of a lesion, CBCT might not be very uh, accurate in that. Uh, but I'm sure with, as, as we're going moving forward with technology, uh, that may have changed by now or, uh, or will soon change. E et al. in 2014, this is a wonderful study, showed that uh, uh, CBCT provides additional information and may lead to treatment plan modifications in approximately 62% of the cases. So if you have a conventional radiograph and you compare that with your, uh, and you make a treatment plan, and when you look at that same tooth uh, using a CBCT, there's a 62% chance that you're going to change your treatment plan because of what you see now, okay? So that's a huge big jump in number in your uh, treatment planning. Uh, I work in Washington, uh, um, that's the West Coast uh, uh, of the US. Uh, this is where I'm settled, this is where I'm working, and that's this famous space needle here. Uh, that's the famous mountain, the Mount Rainier here. Uh, and Washington is very much well known for this mountains and lakes everywhere. Um, that's another night view of the Space Needle here. Pretty famous people uh, love to come visit here. Uh, I've been in the U.S. for a year and a half now, uh, and I've never been to the Space Needle yet. So ho hopefully after the COVID goes away, I get a chance to visit this place also. Okay, so uh, this is the main crux of my whole presentation. Uh, um, so basically... The American Association of Endodontists and the uh, American Academy of Oral Maxillofacial Radiology, they made a joint statement that was updated in 2016. Uh, and they came up with this because there was a lot of questions, you can say, uh, you know, people wanted guidance, when should I do the CBCD, when should I not do the CBCD? Um, you know, the people were concerned about the dose radiation. Uh, uh, um, you know, it, it exposes more to radiation, it can be more harmful. Uh, when should I do it? Is it safe to do it? So they came up with some indications and uh, I'm just going to share that with you. And my, my presentation is going to walk us through all these uh, different uh, uh, categorized, uh, they, what, what they've done is they've broken down into different sections and uh, they've given us uh, indications. So they've gone for diagnosis, divided into diagnosis, initial treatment, non-surgical retreatment, surgical retreatment, special conditions. And very recently, uh, that's in 2016, they uh, added outcome assessment also using CBCDs. So, uh, so we just walk through these uh, very quickly and, uh, and see uh, what they suggest. So let's start with diagnosis. So the recommendation number one is that if you, uh, for intraoral radiographs, uh, should be considered the imaging modality of choice in the evaluation of the endodontic patient. So they're saying is that your intraoral, the conventional x-rays that you do, okay, the film, uh, your digital x-rays with the, with the x-ray cone head is something that you want to do first, okay? Uh, to, to evaluate your patients. So you don't jump to doing uh, CBCDs. This is what they recommend, okay? So, you know, like you see this extra here, it's pretty much obvious that this premolar has a lesion. Uh, probably you don't need to do a CBCT to understand why the patient's coming with pain. Uh, this is another case here. 
where you can see this large lesion on the distal side of this first molar. Uh, patient where I had sensitivity, uh, I don't have to take a CBC to see why patient's in pain, it's pretty obvious. And similarly over here, you can see this patient who came to me with an upper uh, right molar, first molar, uh, has a sharp curve here, you can see this radiolucency around the root, and it's pretty obvious that the root is uh, in trouble. Uh, so maybe you don't want to do a CBCT in these cases where everything is pretty evident for evaluation. Uh, recommendation two is limited FOV, that's the uh, field of view, the one I showed you with those boxes, five by five, larger ones. So limited, limited is the one that's used for endodontics. That's the five or five, five by five or four by four. Um, so the, it should be considered the imaging modality of choice for diagnosis in patients who present with contradictory or non-specific clinical signs and symptoms associated with an uh, untreated or previously endodontically treated teeth. So what we're saying is, when the, when a patient comes to you with a with a tooth that's hurting the patient, whether it has been treated or not been treated before, um, and you're not sure what's going on, why the patient's having pain you go ahead and you can consider uh, doing a, a CBCT. This is the case of mine that I saw uh, a while ago. Uh, you can see that the first molar has been uh, treated and you can see the NB2 here. Uh, the second molar has also been treated. Both were done by the same endodontist. Uh, the patient came back to us uh, saying that he was in pain um, and the root canals were done like about a year ago. Uh, now, X-rays were inconclusive. You could see, I could not see much. You could see maybe some signs of radiolucency over here because it's more darker, I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, you know, I tapped on the teeth, uh, you know, he did not respond on this one, I tapped on this one. He did not respond very much on this one either, but he kept pointing at that second molar saying that, you know, I have troubles here, I'm just not comfortable ever since I've had the root canal treatment. So we said, okay, fine, it's inconclusive, let's go ahead and take a, uh, take a CBC image. Now, if you look at this uh, bottom one here, you can see that this is, the, uh, this is your um, sagittal view. And this is showing that the second molar mesal root is involved, mesal buccal root is involved with the periapical radiolucency. So that uh, uh, was a shock for me. This is one of my first cases when I was doing residency. Um, that showed, you know, that opened my eyes to how good a CBCD or how helpful a CBCD can be in situations where diagnosis gets difficult. Uh, you can see uh, this is your uh, the other view, um, which is the coronal view, and you can see that how the MB1 root. Uh, on the, sorry, the mesobuccal root is involved here. Uh, if you look at the axial view here, you can see why the lesion is there. You can see that this is the mesobuccal root here. There's the MB1 here, and there's a missed MB2. Now, we all know that, you know, maxillary first molars, the first molars have a high incidence of MB2s, and uh, the ones in the second molar, maxillary second molars are lesser. However, um, this case had an MB2 that was missed by the endodontist. And we went ahead and we treated this case. Um, it's another view of uh, the Seattle, Washington here. All right, so initial treatment. Let's go to the next category. That's initial treatment. Uh, what they recommend here is for preoperative, uh, limited FOV, CBCT should be considered the imaging modality of choice for initial treatment of teeth with the potential for extra canals and suspected complex morphology. So if you see something on the radiograph that rings bells, you're not sure what's going on. Uh, you don't want to mess up your case. You want to be prepared better uh, so that you can perform better. This suggests that you go ahead and you do a CBCT. Now, this is a case that came to me during my residency. This patient had been ignoring his infection for almost about seven years. He had a big bump on his gum there. Uh, and uh, you can see that how complex that root anatomy is uh, of this distal root here. With this S-shaped curve looked, you know, I looked at it and I went like, wow, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Uh, because I had access to CBCT, we went ahead and we did it. So I understand the anatomy of this tooth better. Um, and you can see this axial view here, how big the lesion is. Um, and that's your uh, that's your sagittal view. You can see again here, the root shows here, uh, the S-shaped curve. And then also here, you can see there's something going on. It's like dancing over here. And that's the 3D uh, you know, model of the skull there that shows you uh, how much bone loss there is. And you know, I'll, I'll show you more in the video that I've made for this one. So you can understand better. Um, that's that's an enlarged view, one of the uh, sagittal view, where you can see uh, how the root is uh, curving, the S-shaped curve here, and you can see the apex is ending somewhere over here, and not at the root tip. And there's some signs of resorption going on here. Um, so that also helped me uh, be careful that I don't want to make sure that I don't push anything outside of the apex. So you can see how it helped me understand. Uh, 
and, and be prepared. Now let's watch this little quick video here. And I'm, I'm playing around with the sagittal view here. You can see I'm going buckle to lingual right now just to assess what's going on. And here you can see how I'm moving around and, and, and gives me a better understanding of the, um, of the root anatomy here. Um, and of course, it also shows how thin the root is. So I need to be more careful, but jump in with bigger file. And you can see the axial view. I'm going in and out, uh, up and down, sorry. And I'm seeing, uh, you know, how the apex looks. Um, it's another large, I'm just enlarging it uh, just to have a better understanding how it looks. Uh, this is where I took the picture from. So to show you uh, that that resorption at the tip and where the apex actually is ending now because of the resorption. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I went ahead and I just want to show you that the 3D model that I uh, you see on the right side. Uh, I'll bring that up right now. And then you'll see uh, I move that, that, that mandible there a little bit so that I can see better what's going on. I can remove bone also completely to see what's going on, but I left it there to show you how it shows on the, there's so much bone loss around. And you can see how thin the root is, how it's tapering very sharp. Uh, so it's pretty difficult to, okay. Uh, there's a good chance of strip perforation or ledging or, you know, uh, any, any all kinds of errors and breaking a file in there. So uh, once I understood what's going on, we said, okay, you know, we, we need to go ahead and treat the patient because in, in severe pain and problems, uh, I will not go hold, hold through the whole uh, routine, what I did here and how I did this, but I finally did manage to put a 2504 uh, rotary file in there. Uh, this is my hand file, of course. I nego negotiated the canals and the curves with the hand file, and then I eventually, uh, we were not able to finish it because the patient never showed up. And you can understand that patient um, had infection for seven years. He did not bother. Today, he, you know, he came to me because he was in pain, and when the pain goes away, the patient goes away sometimes. Unfortunately, the patient never showed up, so I could not finish this case. But I'm glad I had this uh, working length extra here to show uh, today, uh, you know, that uh, I did manage the curve. So the nice case, uh, uh, the recommendation four was intraoperative. So when in the middle of the treatment, they said, uh, you know, if you're a preoperative CBCT has not been taken, uh, you know, your CBCT should be considered uh, for identif identification and localization of calcified canals. Okay, so uh, let me just show you another case I uh, recently did here. Um, on this, you can see some signs of a canal over here, uh, but uh, it, it's probably calcified. Uh, you can see this deep, uh, big lesion here on the distal of this uh, lateral incisor, and probably that's why the whole canal has been calcifying. Um, I dug in, I went in. You can see I kept myself centered, but I could still not find the canal. Uh, I, when I looked at the X-ray, I felt like, okay, I still have some way to get in there. But I just thought, you know, I need to stop here because I might perforate, you know, uh, the anteriors, uh, upper anteriors are very commonly perforated buckly because of how they incline inside the jaw there. Uh, so I had to stop and make sure that I know where I am and where do I need to move further to find that canal. So I went ahead to the CBCT. You can see here on the exit view that I was too lingual and I'm not centered still. Usually canals are going to be in the center most always. So uh, if my cutting is in the lingual, I know that I'm missing it. So I need to move more center here. And this helped me to make my change my direction of the burr. If you can look here on this uh, uh, sagittal view here, uh, you can also see that uh, I'm more lingual. I'm very close to the canal here, but I need one. I, from here, I know I need to go more buckly, more labially to find that canal. And that's what I did. I changed my angle of the burr. I was able to put my file and my gutta percha there. And I finally obturated the canals. Uh, the canal and uh, without too much distraction of the tooth, I was able to get back in there. Uh, for this, uh, another, uh, now it's post-operative. Now, intraoral radiographs, they, they say that uh, whenever you are done with the uh, case, uh, you want to keep your intraoral radiographs, that's your conventional radiographs, as your preferred uh, 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 method for x rays. So, uh, you know, this is my second molar that I did here, upper second molar. Uh, I finished the root canal treatment. And I just went ahead, I took another angle to show you that there's a, a, a mesobuckle buckle that I found also. So when, when you can do it with two conventional x-rays, you don't need to take a, a, a CBCT image for every time you finish a case. Um, you know, just go ahead and just do your regular, for regular practices, do it with your conventional radiographs. That's the recommendation. That's another uh, one of those places in uh, Washington, pretty beautiful. You can see mountains and lakes. Very famous for this over here. Uh, now we'll move to non-surgical retreatment. Um, they recommend that limited FOV CBCT should be considered uh, if clinical examination and 2D intraoral radi radiography are inconclusive 
in the detection of vertical root fracture. Now, this is a debatable topic. Uh, you know, can CBCT really help? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this is the case here that I picked up from uh, uh, the JOE uh, Journal of Endodontics, and they showed here how there's a lateral lesion, not sure what's going on, they took the CBCT, and you could see that there's a lot of bone loss, not just apically, but on the side also. And uh, so they decided that probably it's a crack tooth. They went ahead, uh, did a CBCT, and they could see this crack line, which is showing by the arrow over here. And then they pulled the tooth out and you can see the crack here and you can see uh, they did a micro CT also and you can see the crack over here. So uh, CBCD helped here. Uh, this is one of my cases that I did before I became an endodontist uh, when I was in Saudi Arabia teaching in a university. Uh, this patient came to us, she had severe biting sensitivity. I looked at the x-ray, it showed like there's a lateral lesion here, uh, you know, periapical uh, lesion over here also on the mesial root. We said, okay, fine, let's go ahead, let's do the root canal. Previous dentist had already uh, cut the occlusal surface to so that her bite becomes easy, but she still had pain. Uh, I went ahead uh, and I did um, the root canal. You can see there are two distal uh, uh, canals, which has an earlier exit in one of the distals, and that explains the lateral lesion there. Uh, however, the patient came back to me with pain. Uh, I removed all the gutta percha and I put calcium on side, um, and the patient went back, came back to me saying, the pain is not going away, the patient is still in pain. And eventually, finally, um, in the follow-up visits, I realized that there was a crack on the measles side, and I eventually asked the patient that the tooth has to be pulled out. So when the tooth got pulled out, I like to study teeth some whenever I have time. So I started, you know, taking pictures uh, of close-ups. You can see how this crack became evident with time, which was not evident initially. I did not have a microscope that time, so I used my loops. Um, I did not see that crack that big at that time, of course, uh, and that grew with time. But you can see how the crack is going all over the floor. Uh, and this next, you can see here that the crack, uh, the measles crack is also going in the canal there, uh, which is a sign of that, you know, this, everything is not working fine for the patient. We got, you know, we, of course we pulled the tooth out and uh, you can see here that uh, the crack is there and the roots here and I've marked them with the arrows here. <laughs> Somebody, somebody needs to, oh man. Okay. But, Oh, that was a tough one. Okay, so anyway, so once we extracted the tooth, we uh, uh, I went ahead and I used methylene blue and I uh, stained the tooth and you can see how deep the crack is going from the mesial side, something on the distal side also. And uh, so this is the disadvantage of just radio radiographs, uh, the conventional ones, because you're not able to see. And if I had a CBCT, maybe it would have made it more evident. Um, now, this is the case that, again, my, my mentor, Dr. Esvido, that I talked about initially, recently sent me, I asked him for some x-rays and the CBCD scan. So he shared this case with me. Um, um, this, this tooth had a root canal treatment done, had a periapical lesion, not sure what was going on. They, they took a CBCT and they saw this crack. You can see on this, I think that's the buckle side, if I'm not mistaken. And another view over here, you can see the crack over here and this tooth had to be pulled out. Uh, now, Dr. Azevedo, like I said, is one of the best uh, uh, radiologists here, oral radiologist here in the US, uh, international speaker, very well renowned. Uh, if you ever get a chance to meet him or uh, attend his lecture, do, you learn a lot from him. Uh, wonderful and amazing guy. Uh, again, on surgical retreatment, it's a limited FOV CBCT should be the imaging modality of choice when evaluating the non-healing of previous endodontic treatment to help determine the need for further treatment, such as non-surgical, surgical or extraction. So if you've done a, if you've done a, a, a treatment on the patient and uh, you're not sure what's going on on the patient, you go ahead and you take an X-ray uh, or a CBCT to understand what's going on. So this is my case that I did uh, about a year ago. Uh, this first molar here, a patient developed sensitivity uh, uh, to percussion. Uh, the tooth did not respond to cold. We went ahead and did the root canal because of the necrosis tooth. Um, I dug in pretty deep. I could not find the MB2. I said, okay, fine. This is one of those rare cases where there, there is no MB2. We finished the case. The patient came back to me after one whole year in follow-ups. Uh, and uh, we found out that the patient was still sensitive to percussion. Uh, patient did not feel good at all. 
and we went ahead we did the cbct because i'm not sure what's going on the patient lost her last molar over there because of a uh, of a crack in the tooth so we said okay fine uh, and that 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 got off you know what if there's a crack here too which i'm missing on the x-ray uh, went ahead we did the cbct and you can see how the sinus membrane here is perforated you can see uh, sinus uh, mucosal thickening in that region that's associated to this tooth here um that's the axial view and you can see how i've missed an mb2 here so that's the mb1 and mb2 here is missed um and that's the other view and you can just you can see how pretty curvy that root is and again you can see how uh, th there's a perforation in the membrane here and the thickening of the mucosal uh, sinus mucosa there uh, so i went ahead uh, you know we opened up everything uh, dug deeper because now i was more confident that there is an mb2 that i need to look for it has a separate exit because now I understood that from the CBCT. And you can see I wasn't able to find it this time uh, and uh, finally operated it. And the patient had immediate relief in the next uh, follow-up appointment I had with her. And now she's doing perfectly fine. So you can see how it aids and helps. Even though you do not see, I did not see a, a, a second uh, mesobuccal canal initially, I was able to find it uh, use, uh, with the uh, uh, aid of uh, the CBCT. Uh, so the model of the story over here is that MB2, uh, according to Kulet and Peters, is 95.2% present. Okay, that's the incidence. For me, it's almost always there. Okay, I consider 95 as 95% as all, always there. So every time I now I jump into the tooth, I always dig deeper a little bit more to to, to look for MB2s, and I always find it now. Um, so that's that's a high number. Okay, if you read somewhere it's 60%, somebody says it's 50%. Uh, those are all uh, old studies that you know did not have the right. Uh, methods of doing it, uh, uh, studying teeth, but uh, the more recent ones are better, of course, uh, because of all the imaging that we have. And it's 95.2% now. Some even studies show higher than that. Uh, limited FOV CBCT should be the imaging modality of choice for non-surgical retreatment to assess uh, endodontic treatment complications, such as an overextended root canal, obturation material, separated instrument, and localization of perforations. Um, this is one of my cases that I got again during residency, you know, a big broken file there, a big periapical lesion. You can see most probably the previous dentist had, uh, you know, dug deeper to um, to retrieve that file. Maybe they were not able to. Um, and then uh, there may be a chance of a perforation here. I'm, I wasn't sure. Uh, and so we went ahead with the CBCT. Uh, I did not see any perforations there. Um, there, was a, there was a missed mesolingual canal there. Uh, and you can see how there's some kind of sealer extruded maybe from the distal one, distal canal and into um, the lesion over here. And then you can see the file coming out and with some sealer, uh, some kind of uh, radio, loose radio opacity there. Um, and of course, so I went ahead, I removed all the deep the portrait there. I tried to uh, remove the file. I could not remove the file. Uh, it was pretty much uh, stuck in there uh, through the whole length. Um, and of course, I had to make sure that I do not Cut deeper here because it was already compromised coronally. I did not want to fracture the tooth or perforate the tooth. Uh, but I was lucky enough to find the, the mesolingual. I think that was the mesolingual canal, I guess. Uh, so I was able to find that. I cleaned up, um, you know, working length, cleaned up, put calcium aside. And in my calcium aside follow ups, and after I obturated, you can see how the lesion has gotten smaller just by placing calcium. So this is my immediate post op the day I finished the, the treatment. And if you compare this with your uh, the, the, the pre-op when the patient came in the first time, you can see how large the lesion is. And just by placing calcium aside for I think it was a month or two months, and then obturating that day, you can see the lesion has started going down. So I left the instrument there because we were not able to retract it. Um, and then, um, you know, because of the limitations from the coronal side, we, um, you know, we don't want to take a risk. And it, the patient was fine now, finally. And, uh, you know, with, with minimal risks, uh, I think we did a good job on the patient there. And this is a state park here with the waterfall and again a beautiful view uh, here and uh, let's talk about surgical retreatment now okay all uh, right so what they say is that this should be the imaging modality of choice that's your cbct for pre-surgical treatment planning to localize root apex uh, or apices and to evaluate the proximity to adjacent anatomical structures so whenever you want to do a surgical retreatment for example you want to uh, make sure you know where the root is how the root looks um, you know, is it close to any nerve or sinus or any other tooth around, uh, you know, so that you're aware of and you're prepared before you get in there. This is the case. Again, I did. Uh, this patient uh, had a root canal treatment done on this uh, maxillary canine on the left side. And uh, you could see this broken file in there somewhere. 
So we went ahead and we, and the patient came back to us, uh, you know, saying that I'm in pain. She had done this by some dentist outside. She was not happy because they could not help her. They could not tell her what's going on. So, you know, I looked at the x-ray. I said, okay, fine. This GP is extruding out into the bone. So probably that's what's bothering her. So we removed the GP. I tried to, you know, get the file out, but it was stuck somewhere uh, that I could not, maybe it was stuck in a groove or something. Uh, so I couldn't uh, get it, but I, I was able to get to full working length, of course. And I operated the tooth. And uh, you can see the file is still there. Now I'm at short of the apex now, so it's not going to the bone. Uh, followed the patient. The patient came to us, uh, and the patient kept complaining of pain. The pain is not going, and we weren't sure what's going on. So we said, okay, let's go ahead and do the root canal. No, sorry, uh, let's go ahead and do the CBCD. Now that's your uh, sagittal view again, and you can see that my GP is is slightly out. But according to the X-ray, if you look back looks like it's uh, it's right there okay at the apex and you can see that there's a lingual or there's a there's a palatal curve there where that broken file remains so what seemed to be a file that may be in the groove or something or an isthmus is actually uh, was broken in the apex there so maybe initially what the dentist did was maybe broke a file in the apex because of the sharp curve and uh, they could not get back in the canal so they kept trying and eventually they perforated and that's what happened. So we said, okay, fine. This is, you know, an infected root tip there. We need to go ahead and remove that surgically. Uh, I went ahead, raised the flap, you know, got the uh, cut the bone out a little bit, and everything was done under microscope. Uh, so we did everything was very micro. Um, uh, cut the root tip there, and then you know, I put my uh, my retrograde filling the MPA there. You can see this bone uh, the hole that I we made here. You can see the radiolucency there. And after a few months, I think this was a two or a three month follow-up, you can see the bone uh, is coming back here. So, and the patient was much, uh, felt uh, absolutely amazing after that. Uh, so that was a good case that we did. And uh, there are special conditions where you want to do your uh, CBCTs. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of, um, some not a lot of, but some programs now in the US are also uh, in the endodontic residency that teach to place implants also. Uh, my residency did not teach me to place an implants. I've, uh, I'm not interested to place implants. And maybe I'm the only person alive in this world right now who has not done a single implant on a patient. Uh, and I'm proud of it, maybe. Um, but they say that, you know, if you want to do implants, uh, um, you know, you want to take a limited FOV and you can plan out your implants. You can see, you know, where the implant should go in. Uh, and that's just a, a software that helps to see where I can place my implant, how far I'm from the nerve. You know, uh, do I have equal buccal and lingual relationships that I don't prefer it here and there? Um, and you know it's it's pretty helpful with uh, implants also. Um, in traumatic injuries, uh, you know where uh, you have injuries and you're not sure what's going on, so you can take a, a CBCT also. This is one of the cases I picked up um, from 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 I think the journal JOE, if I'm not sure, I I don't remember right now. But uh, you can see that this X-ray here showed uh, this one crotal fracture here. But when they took an uh, CBCT, it showed that there was something in the apical also that was not evident here. And uh, when they looked at the uh, sagittal view, you can see how that uh, fracture there is actually going down also. Um, so it just stood, this was not a horizontal fracture, but it was a sort of a horizontal oblique kind of a fracture that uh, got in here. So you can see how that changes the way you see. Uh, these cases. This was this was the case I just saw today in the morning when I was going through the JOE. This is a recently accepted article that's coming up soon uh, to be published, but it has been accepted by the JOE. It's another study by Patel et al. Uh, that showed um, uh, you know this 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 little uh, lateral luxation case here, where on the X-ray you don't see much, maybe just a little widening over here. Uh, but when they did the CBCT, you can see how the tooth has a lateral luxation uh, with some. Um, cortical fracture, uh, bone fracture there. Uh, and you can see on the axial view here how that tooth has moved slightly bit forward and there's a crack in the, um, or fracture in the bone there. So they say that lateral luxation, uh, CBCT uh, showed 80% of the time during radiographs, the conventional ones were just 34% uh, sensitive to, to showing uh, these, these uh, fractures. Exclusive luxation where, uh, you know, slightly comes out also of the, of the socket. Uh, CBCT uh, sensitivity was 92%, radiographs was only 42%, and horizontal fractures, you could de detect them 88% of the time, and then the radiographs was only 69% of the times. So they concluded that CBCT improved clinical diagnosis and management of dental trauma, and uh, management decisions changed in 71.7% of cases after viewing CBCT. So that is huge. 
So something that you would just go like, okay, the patient had trauma. I don't see anything on the X-ray. So just take soft diet for a few days, and you know we'll see. We'll follow you up, and you know you don't need to do anything. Make sure you don't get hit again or whatever you tell the patient. But when you do a CBCT, you see there's there's some kind of relaxation. Your treatment plan changes. Your management changes. And now maybe you want to do, um, you know, put the bone, put the foot back in its socket in its position. Uh, you want to reposition the tooth. You maybe you want to put a splint now. And it's just not a simple, you know, just relax and eat soft diet. But now it's going to be repositioning, uh, repositioning, and it's going to be probably a splint also for a few uh, weeks. Um, so, so this is seventy-one point seven percent of the times the management can change. That is a big number. Um, for resorbent defects, also they said we are not sure what's going on. You can take a CBCT image. This is the case I saw. I was not sure what's going on. It looked like a big lesion. Patient had a history of trauma a long time ago. Uh, periapical uh, lesion associated. I was not sure if, it's, if this is involved also. So we did the pulp test. The pulp test showed that this lateral incisor was vital. And so whatever was happening was happening because of the central incisor here. So we went ahead with the CBCT and you can see uh, on these views how large that uh, lesion is coming from the external. So it's been eaten up externally uh, and how this, uh, this lesion is involving. Now, if you look at this 3D model, it's also giving you a view. But the good thing, like I showed you with the previous uh, uh, case was that you can move these uh, these 3D models around and you can see better. You can see how much it's like an apple bite somebody has taken off. And that's a huge defect over there. Um, so uh, we told the patient, he was a young guy. Uh, we told the patient that, you know, it's better to get the tooth pulled out surgically because it's not going to work out. He said, what other options I have? We told him that probably, you know, you can do the root canal maybe, I don't know how, but and do a, you know, flap raise and, uh, you know, repair that defect over there with uh, some kind of a material. Um, which is quite extensive treatment, and uh, he was he opt, believe it or not, but he opted to the tooth saved. Um, I did not see the patient after that because this was during residency. I graduated by that time. I don't know if the patient returned back to uh, a junior uh, resident and uh, got the spirit done or not. But I, my guess is that probably the tooth was pulled out because that was the better option for this patient, of course. Uh, some underpass here, uh, beautiful one. And this is the last one. This is the outcome assessment. Um, so in the absence of clinical signs or symptoms, intraoral radiographs should be considered the imaging modality of choice for the evaluation of healing following non-surgical and surgical endodontic treatment. Um, so again, they said that, uh, you know, if there's no sign and symptoms and uh, the patient has no problems, on a regular basis, you can just do your uh, radiographs, uh, your conventional radiographs. This is the case I showed in the beginning where with a sharp curve there and a radial lucency all around the root there. Uh, I did this case, I finished the treatment, and uh, after uh, a year of follow-up, you can see that the, uh, the radial lucency is has completely gone, the patient was symptom-free, so we did not find the need of doing uh, uh, a CBCT here. So just the conventional radiographs was enough for us to, to follow up with the patient and see how the patient was healing, uh, and it showed a marked difference here. Um, in the absence of clinical signs or symptoms, if limited FOV imaging was the, uh, uh, modality of choice at the first time you evaluated it too. So maybe for a uh, follow-up, uh, you want to do um, your CBCT. And uh, so initially when you, uh, for for example, this case here, I wasn't sure this was done by an endodontist uh, twice, uh, by the same endodontist. Uh, and then she went to a second endodontist and she got it done again. So that was, she was got, she got it done for the third time and it was still not healing. Uh, she still had problems and I wasn't sure what was going on. I could see that big dark red lucency around there. Uh, but you know, trusting the anodontist, you know, you go like, okay, it was done thrice. Uh, the patient was very evident, uh, very adamant. She was very hell bent to save this tooth. She did not want to lose it. Uh, and uh, so we said, okay, fine, let's go ahead and do a CBCT. And so they say that when you start a case with CBCT, then you want to follow up with that case with CBCT also to see what's going on. Um, so this is the CBCT I did. You can see that there was a big red lucency here. Uh, a, bit, a lot of bone loss on the axial view. You can see there's buccal bone perforation. You can see on this view also, that's a sagittal view. You can see, uh, oh, sorry, this is the uh, coronal view, where this is the anterior posterior. Uh, you can see there's buccal bone loss here. There is a, a sinus membrane, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's perforated. You can see there's mucosal thickening here. And this is your, um, this sagittal view here. Again, you can see loss of a lot of bone over here and um, membrane loss. A perforation and you can see because of thickening here also so you know when you this they recommend that when you do the root canal you want to follow up with cbc that's what i did 
Uh, I told the patient that this is the last time you're going to try it because the patient wanted me to try my level best to save it. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, but just keep in mind that this time it does not work, then you'll have to get the tooth pulled out. So I went inside. I'm not going to show you all the radiographs. Uh, but somewhere in the middle of the treatment, I did feel an MB2 that I tried to catch, but my file broke in there. So um, I told the patient, you know, that I did feel a catch, but it looks like a very dodgy case. And this might not work out for us because that was a very sharp exit. Um, but I'm going to try one more thing before we ask you to extract the tooth. So I dug deeper. So you can see on my post-op operation, you can see how deep I had dug in that mesobuckle root there. I had to make sure that I don't perforate. And I was able to get back in that, uh, re remove that broken file, and I was able to get back in that apical split. So basically, it was not a separate canal. It was uh, one canal that split into two right at the root tip there. Uh, I managed managed to clean that, shape it, and fill it. You can see this on the post-op here. And then uh, on the radiograph, and then I followed the patient up um, after six months. So now what I'm going to show you is in a six months uh, post-op. So this is what uh, the patient showed up uh, for, for the first time to me. You can see, see the same thing. Bone loss on the buckle side, a lot of bone loss in there. And after six months, you can see how bone is coming back and there's buckle uh, plate is, is forming back over there. And I've tried to keep the same angle so that, you know, we can compare uh, without any bias over here. Um, and again, that's the, your coronal view. You can see there is buckle bone loss here. There's a membrane perforation over there. And after six months, you can see there's bone is coming back and there's some kind of membrane. Uh, mucosal thickening is going down here. Um, and this is your the other view here. You can see again, um, you know, some kind of bone coming here on the side here, membrane going down, uh, membrane coming back here and, and mucosal thickening going down um, or right over here. Okay, so you can see, uh, you can compare these and you can see how how my follow-up is going to, is showing me good signs. So uh, the patient is due in June again for a final uh, six, uh, one year follow-up. And I'm hoping that this is going to show me. And again, I'm going to do a CBCT image there for a one-year follow-up and hopefully I'll uh, find some good results show off next time. And this is a view from my house. Like I said, uh, you know, it's uh, mountains and lakes everywhere, a beautiful view from my house, especially when there's uh, in the fall season, when the leaves all go down and fall off and I can clearly see the view here. Um, this is another view on the side there. Uh, you know, this is the la last slide here. You know, I just want to talk about the current trends in CBCT. You know, what CBCT, I remember I told you in the beginning that it was being used for uh, for diagnosis. And now from uh, CBCT, from diagnosis, it's moving towards treatment also, where it helps you to uh, uh, plan your treatment, not just plan your treatment, but execute treatment now. Um, of, so, and, you know, there, it has many applications in dentistry. Uh, and like in surgery, you know, in maxillofacial surgeries, they can, you know, remodel the whole jaw uh, in, a, in a trauma case, for example. But I'm just going to talk about endodontics here. So when you, you know, you, you hear a lot about those ninja accesses, you hear a lot about those trust accesses, uh, which I'm not a big fan of personally, but it's not that topic right now. But, uh, you know, you can use CBCT to make sure that, you know, where I need to drill and I don't miss any canals, you know, and uh, so that um, uh, CBCT can help you there. Um, you can do canal location in a calcified tooth through CBCT that can not just now see where you have to drill, but now it can help you drill uh, there too. Uh, and, and in microsurgery, I'll show you these cases very quickly here. Uh, I'm not going to show you any case with the, uh, with the trust because that's not the, um, that's not my interest over here right now. But you can see that this is a traditional access that we make. This is the conservative access. Uh, usually um, under the microscope, this is the kind of access you can make. With the truss axis or ninja axis, this is what you can do. Ninja is just something in the center, a process that you go in the measle and the bristle separately here. And uh, that aids uh, the CBCT, who, the ones who do it, use a lot of CBCT to make sure that you don't miss any second distal canal or a middle measle canal uh, that helps them there. Um, in cases of, this is another case that I picked up from the Journal of Endodontics. Uh, so now from knowing where to drill, uh, you can make a template now uh, using the three uh, CBCT and then a 3D printer to make this little occlusal kind of a template that uh, makes a little drill hole. Uh, you get a special drill for this and you just have to take your hand through it and it takes you right into the canal uh, where the canal should be in a calcified case. This is a case that I again picked up from the Journal of Anodonics where it shows this size of here has a cal completely calcified canal. Uh, not sure how to get in there. They made this template uh, and they used, you can see this template made here and they the, the, uh, the burr is attached to this handpiece and, and it guides the hand and the burr very exactly to drill. So it does not go left and right, front, back, just where this guide is uh, allowing this to go. And uh, so they place the template in the mouth and they drill through it. 
and they go exactly to where the canal is. Um, and then of course you, you can measure the length and know how much to build, not go too deep because that's where I will find the canal. So you just want to do that, that level and you can see how they finished it. Um, so from just, just able to, not just being able to diagnose now, you can now even help uh, in your treatments now um, here. So, and this is something my, my company that I work for is working on. It's called the uh, guided uh, endomicrosurgery. Uh, where they make a template and uh, similar to what it was using calcified canals. So um, you can very surely now just go from the side and just drill hole uh, in the bone and directly cut the um, root tip for apical surgeries without going here and there. So, you know, when you do surgeries, you can understand the time that, you know, these, uh, especially the back ones, they're so close to each other that you might uh, get into the other tooth and not know where to go. So using the CBCT, then you make this template and then you go use patients at the patient's mouth and just put your drill through here. Of course, you raise a flap first and then uh, you you just, and this is the way to show it here. So, uh, you know, that's all from my side. Uh, uh, you know, CBCT is advancing very much. Uh, this is little my family here. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening, attending. Um, I hope I made it interesting for you guys to, uh, you know, um, look into CBCTs now and see if you can, you know, learn more. Uh, uh, looking at the image is something else. Uh, understanding how to read or how to understand what the image is telling you is a different game. Uh, that is something that you can only learn through hands-on training. So whenever you get a chance anywhere where there is hands-on training on CBCT, do attend uh, because it's just not simply, I see a lot of cases people put down on in the internet where they're just browsing through the images like I showed you initially in one of my cases and they have not, uh, they have not angled their x-rays uh, or the images properly to get the right, uh, uh, um, the right understanding or the right information from the image. So that is another skill that needs, uh, and that can only be taught through hands-on skills. Uh, so I highly encourage you all. Um, if you have any questions, I'm open for questions, and I would uh, be glad to help. And that's, uh, that's all from my side here. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaib, for your nice webinar. I would like to ask everyone if you have any question you can ask in the website chat box. So I will forward to Dr. Shaib and he will answer this. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, we have a question. How can we identify a calcified canal on the CBCT? Uh, on the CBCT, uh, number one, you can confirm that the canal is calcified because sometimes the X-ray shows that it's calcified, but on the CBCT, you can see um, let me let me see if I can bring that case back again so I can show you guys. Um, where are you? Right here. So um, if you look here, um, you can see. For example, let's 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 talk about this, this canine over here on the left side. Okay, you can see the canal right in the center. Okay. Now if you look at the central incisor over here, you can see very bleak signs of calcified uh, calcification here, but you can see the dot there. Uh, what uh, what your uh, CBCT can help you with is to, 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 you know, it'll show you if it's a completely calcified case, uh, it'll show you just dentine. It will not show you any canal. And those are the cases where um, 
you don't want to just that too and tell the patient if the patient is symptomatic maybe you know look for alternatives uh, but if you look at this uh, image on the right side here you can see slight signs of a canal over here which was uh, encouraging that okay fine if i just dig a little bit more deeper on this side here on the buccal side or the label side then i can find that canal there so you will look for these bleak uh, signs of a canal um, you can see the canine is not calcified here so you can see this um, it's nice radio lucent over here but in cal in cases where it's calcified you will either not see anything or you will just see a dot uh, uh, where that will be you know where you want to go and, and drill into so it's not easy and again like i said you have to have the right angles to to view and to understand what's going on if it's not the image first has to be uh, uh, you know aligned first to your planes before you can start moving in and out and seeing what's going on if it's not aligned well uh, it will not show you what you want to see and uh, you can you know misdiagnose a lot of times uh, and and so this is why i said if you get a chance to do a, a course um, even if it's a hands on one or two day course go ahead and attend that will help uh, but yeah that's the answer uh, you'll either see a small dot somewhere or uh, you'll see signs of a calcified canal like you can see in the central incisor you can see there's a dot in the middle over here maybe that's calcified also because it has calcification in there but that's where the canal is okay so if i had to go through this tooth also I know where to go now. Okay. All right. One another question: Is there any magnification issue in the CT? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, it's not more. It's not magnification. I think more pro the bigger problem is the noise creation that you get from images. Uh, where it can uh, you know blur out what you want to see, or you want it, it just gives you a very grainy appearance. So uh, the reason why I kept saying limited FOV is because the more smaller image we try to acquire, the more clearer the image is. So if, if you want to look for calcified canals, for example, uh, and you do a full mouth uh, a CBCT image, then it's not going to show you anything because it's so grainy and it's so uh, noisy that it's, it, just, it just blends, everything blends in and it's, you're not able to see anything. Uh, so for, for uh, endodontics, you want to do a limited FOV because that's going to give you a more clear image. It's going to be more sharper. It's going to be more detailed. Uh, uh, so it's, there's no problem with magnification, but uh, uh, there is problem with uh, with uh, image uh, noise or image uh, uh, blurriness, whatever you want to call that. Uh, it just makes it look more blurry. So, so basically, the, de the details will vanish. Um, but with the limited FOV, the details are much better. One another question. There is there are curves in roots, so how can we identify that there is how much depth is there in CBCT? Can you repeat the question again? Sorry. They are saying that there is vertical vertically curve in the root, and how can we identify that how much the curve is there in the root? Um. So number one, uh, you can do that with your extras also. You have those veins classification and there's some other classification that can help you. Uh, CBCT images, uh, uh, you know, can help you in the way that, again, like I said, um, let me show you that, that case I showed you. Uh, let me bring that up first, this one here. So you can see that this is curving here, but this is not showing you the exact angle of how, that, how much that curve is. It looks like a normal curve here. But if you look at this uh, view where I'm showing front to back, this is, this is like a snake standing, you know, like a, like an angry snake standing in front of you, looking right into your eyes. That's how this curve is actually. Okay, so it's a pretty curved route here, uh, and you can you can you can pretty much uh, um, appreciate it when you look at this when I put the file in the MB2 there. So uh, you again, like I said, you need to be able to ang uh, align your image in such a way that you can appreciate that anatomy. So if you look at this image here on the left side. Which is your uh, which is your sagittal view? You can see that uh, uh, it just looks like a banana curve over here, uh, or, or you know, just a not a very curvy kind of just a normal curve over there. But when I angled it and I uh, and I looked from it, uh, looked at it from the coronal uh, view, anterior posterior, you can see that it's facing towards me now. So the so, so that's how you get an idea of that I, how much you know I need to be prepared with a curved file. I don't want to go with a straight file because I'm going to make a ledge over there or maybe even perforate. Uh, like I showed you in the canine case over there. So these things will just help you understand uh, and, and get better prepared. So I, I think in a conventional x-ray, it just shows you a curve, but on a CBCT, it will show you the, the multi planar curvature. So it, that's not a banana, but it can also be like an S-shape. This one was, 
and it's, it's curving not just uh, uh, distally, but it's also curving slightly palately also. So it's so it's it's multiplanar curvature. So this it gives you a very good idea on CBCD of where the curve is going, where the apex is ending. Uh, so it really really helps, and that's how I planned my whole treatment, and that's how I got in that uh, that mesobuckle canal easily with that sharp curve. The next question is, how can one standardize before and after CBCT scans? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again, please? Okay, sure. How can one standardize before and after CBCT scans? Uh, so that's that's a good question. So um, you is 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 how the CBCT is done. Okay, the, let me just bring up the first. Uh, let me just show you the machines. Uh, so maybe have a better idea of CBCD how it works. Uh, okay, so if you look here, um, if you look, let's look at this image here. Okay, uh, let me just. For example, let's look at this image here. Okay, you can see this. This is where you rest your chin. Okay, so of course the patient height is not going to change with time until unless it's a, it's a small uh, kid who's growing up uh, with time. But in general, this is where you you put your chin. This here uh, are little uh, holders that come and uh, click on your head, and this keeps your head stable. So so your head is pretty stable. So and this unit over here, this this unit over here will rotate around your head. So it's pretty much you get the same image again and again. Okay, it's, uh, so, so it's a very rep reproducible image because you're stabilizing the head over here. You're stabilizing the jaw over there. So the patient's not moving. And so because the patient's not moving and because you're not dependent on an, on an external cone that you have to adjust yourself, but sometimes you can adjust to horizontal, horizontal or to vertical and that can change the angle of the x-ray and you can get uh, you know, a non-sanitized kind of a follow-up with the patient. This here uh, will give you the same image again and again. All you have to do is like what I showed you in my case is uh, back again that you have to go in, in as deep as that to make sure that you can compare your before and afters, um, which is not very difficult, of course. Uh, so I have to keep going back because there are a lot of cases over here. Um, this one here. Okay, so you can see that it's pretty much the same. Uh, depth that I've taken. So as I just scroll down and I stop at this level and I say, okay, this is where I see the bone loss and in, in my post-op, I go down the same level on the tooth and I take a picture. So uh, so you know that this this is pretty much the same uh, uh, height uh, that I've taken at, uh, or pretty much the same dimensions where I've taken this uh, uh, short form. So that's the, that it's a very standardized way to do it. Uh, it's much, much, uh, much more standardized than the uh, periapical extras we take in our daily routines and practices here. Thank you so much, scholarship. Please kindly can you wait only 30 seconds because if there would be any person I can offer. Oh, sure. There is no a problem. website that 30 seconds be there. There is in the That's okay. Don't worry. I understand. I'm okay. all good. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Shiv. I think everyone has cleared their viewers. And okay. this was a very nice webinar with you. We had first webinar on diagnosis of endodontics as well with you. And this was also very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiv, for joining Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for, for, you know, for holding by the screens, listening to me, and watching me. Uh, I'm sorry I did not have my camera on because my camera is not working on my desktop. But, uh, you know, I would like to have a more kind of a facial yes. view. Thank you, so much. thank you. Thank you. Okay.